Hello. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh's annual Yom HaShoah commemoration. I'm Emily Loeb, the Director of Programs and Education at the Holocaust Center. The center connects the Holocaust and the persistence of anti-Semitism throughout history with injustices of today through programs, events, and education. And we strive to address these injustices and then empower individuals to build a more civil and humane society. The center was founded in 1980 by a dedicated group of survivors and their families and has remained a living memorial to those who were murdered, those who survived, and their descendants. This past year, we sadly lost four more survivors, two of whom lived to be over 100 years old. One of those survivors, our beloved Moshe Baron, was interviewed for last year's commemoration. When asked why Yom HaShoah was important, he said, to celebrate Yom HaShoah is to celebrate life and death. He was so well-spoken and had a gift of simplifying the complex into succinct statements. Just as members of this community have done for decades, we are here this evening to mourn the millions who were murdered for no other reason than they were different from others. And yet we're also here to celebrate our survival, which feels more apt right now than it has in a long time. I'd like to thank this year's sponsors, PNC and Highmark, as well as Veronica and Jonathan Schmerling, who are sponsoring this program in memory of Veronica's parents, Agnes and George Roche. I also want to thank the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh, Chaim Steinberg and the students and staff at Community Day School for learning a new song, which they will perform tonight. We teamed up again with Flavia Shamis to help us choose music and work with musicians from the PSO who will be accompanying the in memoriam role. Thank you to the leadership and advisory board of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, the Yom HaShoah Committee for their time and planning of tonight's program, the team at the New Tree of Life, the staff at the Light Education Initiative, and of course, I wanna thank my colleagues at the Holocaust Center, Christina Sahovi, Julia Gatano, Noah Schoen, and Marcel Walker, as well as our student worker, Connor McInich, and our student interns, Sean McIntosh and Lizzie Sharp. So before we begin, a few housekeeping items. As this is a commemorative program, please refrain from applause, even after the music, tempting though it may be, and please take a moment to make sure to silence your cell phones. In case of an emergency, Exits are located behind me and then behind you um, through the doors through which you came in. Last but not least, I want to thank the Survivor and Generations community. I started as a volunteer at the Holocaust Center years ago sharing my grandparents' story of survival. I developed my presentation with the guidance and support of this community. Most people here probably don't know but we gather regularly and we meet with the survivors and the generations community, the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. We're a group that's bonded by intergenerational wounds that are hard to heal and propels us to speak out and to take action to ensure that no one else suffers like our families did. We're like a big extended family and the Holocaust Center is honored to be our home base. Will those survivors and descendants of survivors who are willing and able please stand? Take a moment. Look around. We're what my grandmother called the greatest victory. Thank you for joining us this evening, and now I'm honored to turn the program over to Larry Lebowitz.
Good evening. My name is Larry Lebowitz, and I'm honored to be the chair of the Holocaust Center Advisory Board. I'm happy to be with you this evening. The Holocaust Center has been hosting Yom HaShoah commemoration since at least 1978, a couple of years before the Holocaust Center was even established. The commemoration varies from year to year, with a specific theme driving the programming and different people participating. What has been remained constant, however, over the years is that there is a solemn moment where we remember who was lost during the Holocaust and the sacrifices people made to survive or help others survive. Stories of survivors and carrying out their memory is truly at the heart of all that the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh does. And we are honored to bring some of those survivors' stories to life tonight with the centerpiece of tonight's program, a film by two Chatham University students that features local Holocaust survivors and centers on the theme of rescue and survival. Tonight, you will also hear prayers, songs, prose, poems, and music performed by area middle and high school students, rabbis, musicians, and community members. Accompanied by music played by members of the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, we will also remember the Holocaust survivors who settled in Pittsburgh and since have passed away. We cannot proceed with the program without acknowledging the significant rise we've seen in anti-Semitism here and around the world, and of course, the plight of the Israeli hostages. As we remember and think of them, we also think of the significance of this commemoration and turn our attention to the connections we have to those who came before us, those who are beside us now, those we've lost, and those who we cannot yet see. These connections not only live in tradition, but also in strength, in hope, and in compassion. And it is our job as the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, as the newly reimagined Tree of Life, and as a Jewish and community as a whole, to not only maintain, but strengthen these connections, particularly in these challenging times. The lessons of the Holocaust and the need to remember them and take appropriate action has never been more important. Thank you for being with us this evening. Sturm wind, sturm wind, mit unerren und blitzen. Auf der Welt wird der Schill, als mit Pentischen die Fritzen. Als Stadt schrecken, als Stadt schrecken, verdrücken alle Wegen, verdrücken alle Wegen. Wie Lanz mit Koi in der Faschist es, wenn uns sei geschlägen. Wie Lanz mit Koi in der Faschist es, wenn uns sei geschlägen. Wenn 
Enough. The train of 250 didn't make it, but 669 did. 250 never seen again. 669 who lived. Their parents hear no more. The children were spared. What but a little dent have I made? And if you hadn't, everyone stood by, denying the truth, ignoring the spectacle, but you stepped up. They would have done the same, but they didn't. You did. Six years of war, six years of loss, nine months of rescuing children. I kept a record, the world knows, They think I'm a hero. You are. I only did what was right. You led them to refuge. You freed them of the whore. You gave them a home. How many others had the chance and didn't? I needed to save more. No, the world needed to. We'll play the game, <clears throat> the key game, the game with time. Just one more, he could barely sit up, just one. You were perfect, two or three minutes off. He's now abandoned, covered in dust and lime, yet dead to the people who would knock. Ding dong. Just one last rehearsal, stamped his feet. Say something, you're not little at all. Say something, he turned pale. Mama's at work, and Papa, silent. And Papa, he's dead, was already long dead. Everything will depend on you. Say something, ding. You were perfect, but they need more time. He stood in the middle of the room, staring at the bathroom door. He is dead, dong.
Please turn to page 10 and join me in Anima Amin. Anima Amin, Anima Amin, Anima Amin, Memona Mashiach, beviat Mashiach, ani mamin, veafalpi sheit mamea, im koze ani mamin, ani. customary to rise for El Malay Rahamim, the prayer for the souls of those who have departed. El Malay Rahamim, Shochen Bamarohumim, Hamse Minokanechona, Tachat Kanfe Hashbina, Bemalot Kidoshim, Utohorim. Kazor harakia mazhirim et nishmot kolachenu bene Israel anashim nashim v'taf shenit bechu v'shenech neku v'shen Israfu v'shen ergu began erente menu katam ana balarachamim hastira. Ambassador Knach Becha, Leo Lamim, Utsror Bitrahim, Ednish Mautehem, Adonai Hunachalatam, Vianu Hulishalom, Almishkavotehem, Vinomar Amen. God of mercy who dwells on high, grant lasting rest beneath the wings of the divine presence among the holy and pure whose souls shine with splendor, bringing such light and brightness to the souls of the house of Israel, adults and children, and the others who were killed, butchered, burnt, strangled for the sanctification of God's name. In the Garden of Eden, may they find rest. Source of mercy, shelter them forever under the wings of your protecting love. May their souls be bound up in eternal life. God is their portion. May they rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. My name is Oscar Singer, S-I-N-G, uh, and I'm, my, how old I am? I am May 10th, 1925. I'm from a town, a little town, 200, maybe 50 people, Radomish Wilki, Poland. My survival in the Holocaust is, I was, when I was 13 years old, when the Germans came in, maybe a few days later, they took us to work. We had to be six in the morning. And I was 13 years old. We had to go, you see bushes here, all the little animals walking around. 
we had to cut off the bushes to make streets for for the army, for the soldiers to come in, the, for the German people. And we had to do that. We had to cut the trees, remove the trees, and, and clean in and all things that every day. Six in the morning they came in, and in German they say, house, 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 go, 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 go. And that's, that's all it was. Since then, I was in, the, in slavery, so. And, but that's all it is. That's all I can tell you. The more you, the more you work, so the more they want you to work. You have to suffer like a dog. You know, when a dog gets hurt on the car or the, the holler screams, she'll want, the dog still wants to help, even if the whole thing's there. So we have the same thing. We were just like dogs, worse than dogs. Maybe the dogs they gave much, much, enough to eat, but you didn't, wasn't there enough. In life, and I'm 99 years old, I'm not now, I'm going to be in, in a few months. <laughs> you have to believe in God first. You've got to go to things, you've got to do what, whatever nationality you are, whatever religious you have, you've got to believe there's a God and they help you. Everybody says, oh, we're all true. We're going to be dead all. I says, no, no God, God will help. My dad used to say, just be good. Be good and nice to people. And I was like that. I was born in Vienna, Austria, December 25th, 1926. The day before Hitler came in, my father had a sister in Hungary in Budapest. And she called him and said, why don't you bring the children? And the they always used to go to Budapest, it's like a few hours on the train. And come and stay for the weekend, see what happens. He says, nothing's going to happen. He had his saber from World War I, and he was a veteran, and what's going to happen? And so slowly... Hitler saw that this was easy. So why not take more? He took a little piece of Czechoslovakia. Then he took the rest of it. Nobody did anything. And that's more or less and then the laws against the Jews and gays and um, Roma, um, you know, the, Italian, the Hungarian, uh, and everything was done legally. Uh, if you had a furniture store, you were Jewish, they would appoint an Aryan leader for you. Like you didn't know what you were doing, so we're going to send somebody into your store and it'll be, he'll be your leader. And he came in the next morning with the proper documentation and he told you, I'm the new leader here, you can leave. And that's what they did to my father's studio. Wow. And this was all legal. And in May, he was picked up. Um, and, and sent to Dachau. After it was obvious that Jews were not going to have a good time in the new Germany. Having been to the United States, he immediately went to the embassy and made applications to immigrate to first. In the meantime, he's in the camps. And he was allowed to write one postcard a month. And on the postcard, 
he wrote, go see Uncle Simon. Uncle Simon was the uncle in Pittsburgh. So my sister, my mother, and I got the visas to come to the U.S. But when we came here, there was his uncle's family who took the three of us in. Then the family had a little gathering, family that we didn't know. And there was a young lawyer in that group, a guy who was, his name was Izzy Binstog. He was a lawyer, not big law, no, not Reed Smith. I mean, just him and an old lady secretary. And he said to my mother, what did Herman do that he's in jail? And she tried to explain to him that if you're Jewish, they can do that. Now, didn't sit with him. And so he went to the congressman of this district, a fellow named Eberharter, obviously of German descent. And he said to him, this man is in jail in, in Germany because there was no Austria. You had a German passport. And his wife and family are here. And why can't he join them? Eberhardt went to the German embassy made an appointment as a congressman and said uh, his wife is very sick and we need to bring him here. And so the embassy, the ambassador told Berlin to let him go. And one day they, he went there and they said, you're free to go. Okay. Well, well you know, uh, anyways, my name is Harry Schneider. Uh, I'm just a, a child Holocaust survivor. I'm probably one of the youngest survivors, that, you know, uh, that are around right now. Uh, I came, I came to the United States when I was really like 13 years old. I was only like two and a half years old when the war started. So I'm not going to try to tell you that I remember everything, you know, that happened at that period of time. Uh, but however, my father was actually in the Polish army at that time. So we figured we'd try to get on the Russian side to escape the Germans. However, there was a treaty between the Germans and the, and the Russians at that time. And we had a difficult time to get onto the Russian side. So we left our home, Poland. We left actually with my, uh, uh, with, uh, my father and uh, also with a cousin actually that lived with us plus an uncle and his wife, and we escaped uh, into the forest, hoping to get on the Russian side. However, there was a treaty between the Russians and the Germans, and we couldn't get across. So we spent like in the forest for two years before we, we were able to get into the Russian side. Uh, again, I was just a child at that time, so I you know, so can't really tell you too much about that. We were sent to, to Russia. And uh, we lived with a uh, Russian family there for until the, the war was over. And by that time, it was diff difficult. You know, in, in Russia, it was very difficult. So there was hardly any food, but somehow we managed to survive. And uh, after uh, the war, uh, we went back to Poland to see, you know, what happened to our family. We found out that, you know, our house was destroyed, and you know, my grandmother and we, we didn't move with us. Uh, they, you know, they took her out. Uh, the, all the people who were in the town were, were massacred by the by the Nazis. So, actually, uh, my father, who I told you, was in the Russian army. He came back uh, with the Russian army back to Poland, 
and uh, he was able to find us in a DP camp, which is a displaced persons camp that we lived in. And from there, uh, we, uh, we we weren't going to stay in Poland any longer because I told you we we found out that the whole family was massacred. Uh, we had grandparents, uncles, etc. So uh, we had to move out. We moved into we we left uh, Poland. We went to uh, somewhere. We had to go. So our family went to Austria, and we were placed in the DP camp, which is a displaced persons camp. And we lived there uh, for about five years. And uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't know a lot of people, you know, moved, moved to Israel, moved to other places. Uh, they moved to other countries. They had family. We didn't have any family uh, anywhere. So uh, we stayed there until uh, uh, actually at that time, President Truman uh, approved gave permission something for 100,000 Jewish people to come to the United States. At that time, uh, we were one of the fortunate ones that came to the States. We had actually the Jewish Family Services, which is in Washington, Pennsylvania, which is, you know, you probably know, it's right outside of Pittsburgh. They sponsored us. So we, we came and lived in Washington, Pennsylvania there for, yeah. Yeah. anyway, anyways, uh, now we're wondering why we're still talking about the Holocaust. I think it's very important, especially now. So we must uh, I'll try to do whatever we can to uh, talk about it and uh, make sure that everybody knows about it that it doesn't happen again. That's the best thing that I can uh, uh, tell you as far as a survivor is concerned. Well, a survival means uh, that I, I made it. We made it. Uh, in fact, originally, you know, when my parents came, you know, came to Pennsylvania, uh, a lot of times that uh, uh, my father, as an example, never wanted to talk about what happened. And so I didn't really ask him too many questions. Every time that I, I even tried to ask a question, he would tell me, you know, uh, I brought you here. I was still, don't forget, I was like 13 years old when I came to the States. So we brought you here and make the best that you can. Uh, you know, we, we survived. A lot of people didn't. In fact, like, uh, uh, as an example, in Poland, only about 10% of the Jewish people uh, survived. So you, you were talking about like 3 million, 3 million people. So we were one of the fortunate ones that uh, were, were able to survive. So what, is it, what does it mean to me? I think I had to do the best that I could in order to make, you know, to make a living and to uh, you know, because my, to, to let them know, you know, what I experienced and uh, uh, so they can understand how difficult it was to survive. Okay. My name is Irene Skonlik. I was born in Poland, the city of Przemysl, which is on the Ukrainian border, uh, on August 22nd, 1937 which means that I was just 10 days after my second birthday when Hitler invaded Poland and started World War II. I'm sorry, but you know, what is, what is survival? Yeah, it's staying alive and, and, and staying human, being able to relate other than with in anger and vengeance, uh, I mean, Jews made friends with Germany. France made f Jew uh, friends with Germany. Germany attacked and conquered France three times. Yeah, 1870, 1914, 1945, uh, I mean, 1940. Uh, it took two old <laughs> statesman, it was Charles de Gaulle and Adenauer and France and Germany, old people, old men who had lived through the horror of wars. So enough, enough. With two people, why can't we get along? Why can't we live together? They did it, wasn't easy, wasn't easy. 
life goes on and you accept reality and you make peace with it. Because this constant fighting and abuse of each other, that is not survival. That is not, that may be existence, that is not living. Many members of my family perished during the Shoah. Grandfathers, aunts, uncles, cousins. All I have are worn black and white photos of lives frozen in time and never completed. As the daughter of two courageous Bergen-Belsen concentra concentration camp survivors, Agnes and George Roche, I light this candle for the millions of parents who cannot say Kaddish for their one and a half million children murdered in the Holocaust solely because they were Jewish. We must remember today as anti-Semitism is aggressively sponsored and encouraged to keep the lessons of the Holocaust and its relevancy ever present. So we light the second candle in honor of my mother, Ellen de Young Tissenbaum, who is a survivor, and my grandparents, Hedda and Albert de Young. <clears throat> One interesting thing, sort of a segue, we recently were in Israel in April, and I took my mother and my wife, we went on a mission. We happened to be there during the Iranian bombing. We went on the mission, my mother's 80 years old, she wanted to come with us, that's what she wanted to do for her 88th birthday. She said, that night evoked memories she's never had before. It reawakened her concentration camp nightmares. It reawakened what she went through. And she just looked at us and said, like, we can't let this happen again. We are also lighting this candle in memory of all the people who have died because of October 7th. Never again is now. I'm Sarah DeVos, daughter of Holocaust survivors Usher and Minna Dodowitz from Poland. Um, my father survived by running, hiding, and traveling by foot across several countries. My mother survived th two concentration camps through her skillful seamstress abilities. They always felt that they had a higher power guiding them and felt very fortunate that they had survived. I'm lighting the candle in memory of the, all of the families we lost, the Grossman, Podolska, Dodowitz, and Hafner families, and for all of the six million that perished during the Holocaust. Lighting the fourth candle in honor of my grandmother and uh, my great-grandmother, uh, Alyssa and Josephine Schaefer uh, in Schoenberg. Uh, she, uh, when she was in her mid-20s, she was uh, liberated from Bergen-Belsen, uh, and she went on to live another uh, 70 or so years. Uh, she was able to see her uh, children, uh, her grandchildren, uh, and all of her great-grandchildren uh, uh, be born and spend time with them. She was uh, one of the most amazing women uh, that I have uh, ever got the chance to know 
and lighting this candle uh, in uh, her uh, honor as well as uh, all the family members uh, and uh, others who did not make it. I'm the granddaughter of Herman Snyder, who was a survivor from Vilnius, Lithuania. I'm lighting a candle on behalf of his family, who didn't make it. Uh, his parents, who were Kalman and Taiba, and his siblings, who were Ganesha and Zorch, as well as the six million who perished. My name is Avi Baron Monroe, I'm the daughter of Moshe and Malka Baron, both uh, survivors. My father was a partisan who uh, fought and was able to save his mother. Um, his father and his sister did not survive. My mother was put into a concentration camp. She lost her whole family. Um, I light this candle in their memory and in memory of all the relatives that I never knew all the cousins that never got to live, um, and the families that never got to uh, exist because of the, the murder that happened. Um, my parents emerged from their time uh, with strength, with faith, with love, with positivity. Uh, my mother said, we never should hate because hate is what leads to what we experienced. And my father said, we should never be complacent because to be complacent is to be complicit. Um, he also recently said, the way you fight anti-Semitism is you just be a better Jew. And he was very proud of um, Jewish education and the fact that I was the head of school at Community Day School and that these students that sang today were students of Community Day School. And that is where he was optimistic and felt that the future was strong. Um, I light this candle in memory of my parents and all those that were murdered. Together we offer, together we recite words of Kaddish Yatom, the mourner's prayer, found on page 14, affirming a relationship with God even in the depths of tragedy and sadness, affirming a connection with those who have passed. If it is comfortable for you to do so, we invite you to rise in body or spirit as together we say, Yit Gadal, Vayit Kadash, Shemei Rabbah, Ba'alma Divra Hirute, Vyam Lich Malchute, Bahaye Hon, Vyome Hon, Uvhaye de Hobet Yisrael, Ba Gala, Vizman Kariv, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shemei Rabbah, Mvarach, Lealam, Ulame Amaya, Yit Barach, Vayish Tabach, Vayit Pa'ar, Vayit Ramam, Vayit Nase, Vayit Hadar, Vayit Ale, Vayit Halal, Shemei de Kudusha, Barich Hu, Leela, Min Kol, Birchata, Vishirata, Tush Bechata, Venechamata, Damiran Belma, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shalama, Rabba, Min Shemaya, Vehaim Alenu Val Koyasrael, 
v'imru, amen. O se shalom v'imramav, huya se shalom, aleinu v'al ko Yisrael v'imru, amen. May the one who makes peace in the highest of heavens make peace for all who mourn. You're welcome to be seated. Good evening. It's my privilege to read uh, a text titled Beyond Memory, which was written by Shulamit Bastaki. Uh, she was born in Vilna in Lithuania in 1941. On Yam Hasua, each year, I kindle the memory candles. I kindle them in the memory not only of my grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins who did not survive the Holocaust. I kindle them also for a Roman Catholic nun, a righteous gentle Gentile who risked her life to save mine. These memorials stir in me the image of a little girl who was huddled by herself for more than three long years in a small, dim cellar. While my family and the nun are blessedly recalled now at middle age, they do not lead to any real recollection of the quiet, frightened, curly-headed little girl. She is the figure that won't come to mind, won't allow herself to be part of me now. She crouches forever in the recesses of a deeper cellar the seller of my mind. When I was born in August of 1941 in Vilna, the center of Jewish life in Lithuania, four weeks after the Germans entered the city, our deadly game of hide and seek began that year and lasted until 1945. My mother and father, who also survived the war, have had to tell me the story of my survival. They did so in the barest of terms, for any detailed narrative was too painful for them. We rarely mentioned the past at home, even now in America in 1996. I don't remember the nun either. I know that she came as often as she could, and she brought me enough food to survive until she came the next time. I must have been overjoyed each time she appeared to interrupt the dark flow of hours. Now I do not see her face. I cannot hear her voice, nor do I feel the touch of her hands. But somehow, even without memory, I know, I know that she gave me much more than food. She shared herself through kind words, a show of affection. I emerged from the cellar malnourished and sick when the Russian army liberated Vilna. The nun had placed me on the bank of a river where I was found by a Lithuanian man who then placed me in a Catholic orphanage where I was given a Lithuanian name. My family found me in the orphanage by recognizing a birthmark on my body. After our reunion, we traveled by train to central Poland, where I went to a rehabilitation center sponsored by the Joint Distribution Organization, a facility for Jewish children. There I was physically and emotionally rehabilitated. They gave me quad slide treatments for sun deprivation, and more importantly, a safe place where I could be a normal child. I often wonder why I don't remember. The answer I give myself is that my memory is blocked as a result of being deprived of family, of nurturing, and of the most basic human needs. The feeling of a lost early childhood will remain with me for the rest of my life. But my feelings of respect and gratitude for that nameless nun will remain with me too.
I'm Carol Zawadzki. This evening I'm here as a daughter of Mordechai Yosef, my father, who was a liberator at Mauthausen concentration camp in Austria. Um, I'd, I'm honored to read the words of Jack Sitzimer. Going back and forth to work every day on the train, we could see the flowers starting to grow and the trees blooming. People spoke about how good it would be to be liberated. When we came back to the camp on May 4th, just like every other day, we got our portion of soup and went to sleep. The next morning, there was no 5 a.m. reveille. I heard people saying, look out, look out the windows. I looked out, there were no guards or machine guns. The guard towers were empty. There weren't any guards at the main gate either. Even so, everybody stayed inside because we suspected that the Germans were up to something. Finally, at about 10 a.m., a jeep and four American soldiers pulled inside the camp and informed us that we were free, we were liberated. Few people left that day. The majority were too weak to walk. The second day, more people left. They felt stronger because they were fed better. Finally, on the third day, I left with my friend. We didn't go through the main gate. We tunneled underneath the double fence to the outside. I didn't believe I could safely leave through the gate. The nearest city was Linz, Austria, about 20 miles away. We hitchhiked. We walked. We rested. This short distance took us three days. In Linz, we walked around, still wearing our concentration camp clothes, Suddenly, sirens sounded. An Austrian woman opened her door and told us to come inside. There was a curfew. No one was allowed out after 5 p.m. It was a Mrs. Weber who took us in. She called out to her neighbors she, to come over, one of whom was a barber. He took us out to the backyard, shaved our long hair off, and burned our clothes. Then we took our first hot shower with real soap in many years. Mrs. Weber gave us new underwear and nice clothes. These things had belonged to her two sons who died while fighting in the German army. She showed us the bedroom where we could sleep. It had two beds in it, but we slept on the floor because we weren't used to sleeping in a bed. In three months, she nursed me back from my weight of 75 pounds to 85 pounds. Feeling stronger, I decided to travel, to try to locate my brother. In Italy, I found someone who told me that there was a man in Germany who had been in the same camp as my brother. I left Italy and found this man who had survived Pustkal camp, only to be told that my brother did not survive. I had known long before this that my father mother, and the rest of my family also did not survive. In June 1949, I sailed to America. Reentry, Arnold Bloom, born Nuremberg, Germany, 1922, private first class, G2 intelligence, 104th Infantry Division, 7th Corps, First Army. Late one afternoon, a truck convoy picked us up in Malmody to take us to Aachen. It was October 1944, and we were U.S. infantry replacements destined to fill the gaps in the ranks of units depleted at the battles around Aachen. We dozed while riding on the hard truck benches, our rifles held vertically between our legs, but woke to the distant rumble of guns. The rumble got louder as we got closer to our destination. The canvas truck roof precluded our seeing upward or to the sides, but we caught glimpses of gun flashes through the rear window of the truck cab. 
It was completely dark when we stopped in the clearing of a woods inside the German border where we were ordered to get off. After my eyes had adjusted to the dark, I noticed ghost-like a tent camp where we would spend the night. The trees around us were arrayed in neat ranks and files, composing in turn large rectangular groves. The next morning we boarded the trucks again, which took us to a large complex of buildings, a former German army camp outside Aachen. I felt very strange being back in the land of my birth and that of generations of my family, the land for which my late father and his brothers had fought in World War I. The five and a half years of my absence had totally estranged me. There were many facets to my estrangement. The architecture of the camp buildings was heavy and stolid. The walls were thick, the windows small, the roofs large and steep-sided. It all looked like the administration building in the concentration camp Dachau from which I had been released six years earlier. I felt unclean, as though I had touched something filthy and vile. Germany had become an abomination in my mind, a somber, dank dungeon. The very orderliness and rectilinearity of the woods where we had spent the previous night in the camp where we now found ourselves combined to recreate my mind an overwhelming feeling of oppressiveness from which I had been subliminally freed in America. The camp itself represented to me a site of institutionalized aggression. From it, its former occupants had set out to overpower and suppress its neighbors, to metastasize the Hitlerian cancer of hate, a symptom of accumulated darkness in the German national essence. I did not realize, as I do today, that this darkness is endemic to all peoples, that it is characteristic of the human psyche when it falls victim to self-veneration and becomes oblivious to aspirations of oneness with God and the world. Today, as I relive these memories, I perceive both hopefully and sadly that people everywhere are far more the same than they are different. Within them all, they harbor the potential for good and evil. I am similarly persuaded that man has not changed since he appeared in the universe. He has only improved his tools. I light this candle for and in the memory of all the heroic allied veterans of World War II. I will sing the song of the partisans, first in English and then in Yiddish, and I offer it in honor and in memory of Abe Salem and Moshe Barron and all the other partisans. Never say that you now go on your last way, though darkened skies may now conceal the blue of day, because the hour of which we've hungered is so near. Beneath our feet the earth shall thunder, we are here. From land of palm trees to the far off land of snow, we shall be coming with our torment, with our woe. And everywhere our blood has sunk into the earth, shall our bravery, our vigor blossom forth. We'll have the morning sun to set our day aglow. Our evil yesterdays shall vanish with the foe. But if the time is long before the sun appears, then let this song go like a signal through the years. This song was written with our blood and not with lead. It's not a song that summer birds sing overhead. It was a people amidst burning barricades that sang this song of ours with pistols and grenades. So never say you now go on your last way. Though darkened skies may now conceal the blue of day, because the hour for which we've hungered is so near, beneath our feet the earth shall thunder, we are here. Zognish kein molas du gates some lets and vague, Chachimlin blyen efarstellen bloyeteg, 
kum in wet noch unser eus gebenk de scha. Sveta peukt on unser trot mir sein in da. Von grünen Palmenland bis weißen Land von Schnee. Wir kommen an mit unser Pein, mit unser Weh. Und wo gefallen sie das Spritz von unser Blut? Sprotzen wird durch unser Gwure, unser Mut. Es wird die Morgensun begilden uns dem Heint. Und der Nächten wird verschwinden mit dem Feind. Nur räub versamen wird die Sun in dem Kajor. Wie a Parol soll gehen das Lied von dort zu dort. Das Lied geschrieben ist mit Blut und nicht mit Blei. Es ist nicht kein Liedl von a Feugel läuft der frei. Das hat a Volkswischen fallen dick gewendt. Das Lied gesungen mit ne Garnis in die Hand. Da sag nicht kein Mal, als du gehst am letzten Weg. Gott schimmeln bläuen, er verstellen bläue Tag. Komm in Wett nach unser Eus gebänkte Schau. Sveta peukt on unser Trott mir sein in da. Komm in Wett nach unser Eus gebänkte Schau. Sveta peukt on unser Trott mir sein in da.
Thank you.
Our work of remembrance and efforts to dismantle anti-Semitism extend beyond this evening and go year round. Thank you for joining us this evening and please check out our website to see all of our upcoming events. If you're interested in becoming involved in the Generations community, please let us know. And thank you again for being here this evening and to everyone who participated in the commemoration. Have a wonderful night, thank you.